All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome on board. I'm Jessie Chahel, and thank you for joining us today on Isentia's Media Masterclass. Today's topic, content that matters to the media. I'm Jessie Chahel. I'll be the moderator for today's panel discussion. So once again, a quick special mention to our esteemed panelists, as well as close to 600 impressive participants joining us today. Welcome everyone. We trust you'll benefit from this session. Now, let's look at what's happening globally, right? There are huge changes happening in the media right now, and it's an exciting time as well to look at the status quo while it's being disrupted now more than ever before. But what we need to keep in mind is that we collectively can make changes if we embrace this together. One of the challenges for editors and journalists at this point is they want a story that can help them sell, whether it's a magazine, newspaper, or drive traffic to their website. They want a story that can help them gain respect of leaders or other media outlets, as well as advertisers. Also, they are looking for stories that fit their brand and appeal to their audience. So big question today is, what really does the media want in creating news stories? We've just come out, or rather we're still, uh, you know, towards the tail end of what is the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, this is, has, has had a profound effect on life worldwide. And this crisis has brought to the fore the, the perennial question of quality of content, media freedom, factual reporting, easing anxieties of the public and meeting the needs of the community at large. So a lot of things to juggle at the same time, but it also begs the question, what are the criteria to strike this balance? And we know on the media side, newspapers, magazines, radio, television companies, they receive a vast quantity of information uh, as well as material every day. And the pressure is on them so that they can have uh, the space to broadcast um, all of this. But because of restrictions, this also means that journalists can only use a tiny portion of what they receive through various channels. So another question, how then do they choose what to cover? There is fierce competition within the media. Many journalists also have an appetite for occasional exclusive stories, which are considered to be sufficiently important, while their competitors will have to follow up on those stories as well. Aside from the media themselves, other stakeholders, PR practitioners, corporate communications, brands and advertisers also want their messages, stories, CSR efforts heard. So how do we strike that balance? Uh, also, we'll look at how we try to improve media relations overall. So in this session today, we'll focus on the media industry in Malaysia, understanding the current landscape, challenges and changes. What is the new normal for the industry now? We'll also look at what makes news and one factor that we cannot ignore the importance of authentication in an age where fake news and misinformation is rampant. Very quickly, let me go through the agenda today. We will start the discussion. We'll also have uh, the poll session open so that you can participate in answering uh, the poll questions where we can gauge better uh, what are some of your pain points and understand your concerns better as well. For those who are asking, no, you will not be seen or heard. The audio is muted. We cannot see you. We can't hear you as well. But we do want to hear from you. And so there is a Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, please do type in your questions, observations or comments at any one point uh, or any time during the uh, session today and I will try to post these questions as we go. Uh, we have 60 minutes on the clock and counting. Today's masterclass is being recorded and a copy of this session will be emailed to you along with the key highlights. You can of course follow Icentia's uh, LinkedIn as well as their Facebook or simply log on to their website. Now, uh, joining us uh, for this masterclass is, of course, uh, the representative from Icentia, and I'd like to introduce him to you right now. He is Kunalan, and he is uh, the director of uh, sales uh, coming from Southeast Asia, and he will want to give a welcome address and say hello to all of you. Kunal? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right, all yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I, uh, I hope all of you are safe and um, coping well uh, with current situations um, we face in the global uh, pandemic that we are, and I'm sure we will get through together. 
Right. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I am Kunal Ramasamy. Uh, I'm the regional sales director uh, of Southeast Asia uh, in Icentia. And on, obviously on behalf of my team, uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome and thank you uh, for joining us uh, today on our very first uh, media masterclass uh, Malaysia. Right. And to the panelists, uh, I would like to, uh, to express my appreciation and gratitude uh, for taking the time out of these schedules and, uh, to join us and provide your experts' opinions and industry insights uh, on our media on our media landscapes. Uh, I look forward to insights uh, discussions uh, among our panelists and Jesse, uh, who will be our moderator for today. And we hope you find uh, this session insightful. So thank you. Back to you, uh, Jesse. Thank you very much, Kunalan Ramasamy, Regional Sales Director of Southeast Asia at Icentia. Of course, you can visit their website for more information on their services. Ladies and gentlemen, participants, thank you for joining us. Our speakers are masters of their craft. They come from various perspectives within the communications and media industry with local, regional, and even international experience. They have a wealth of expertise tucked under their belts. And today, I sent us providing you, yes, you, with an exclusive front row seat and access to all of them. So let's try to make the most out of this masterclass. It gives me great pleasure to now introduce the masters on today's masterclass. First up, we have Andreas Oyazaki. He's a media maverick. TEDx speaker and neuro-linguistic programming coach. Now, Andreas is a multi-award winning marketing professional, a certified coach and NLP practitioner. Uh, he's a TEDx speaker, a writer, and amongst the 100 most inspirational LinkedIn icons in the country. And in his career, he has built and managed several media agencies from names like Publicis, Omnicom, WPP, and Havas, leading them in flagship positions in countries like Japan, Taiwan, and of course, here in Malaysia. Joining us also is Pramesh Chandran, CEO and co-founder of Malaysia Kini, a 2019 TED Senior Fellow, a recipient of Asia's Foundation's Chang Lin Tan Fellowship back in 2010, and was also awarded the Media Personality of the Year in 2012. He is a business coach for tech startups and has coached over 50 companies in the past eight years. And for those of you who would like to know a bit more stats, Malaysia Kini is Malaysia's top independent news website, Currently, their site reaches over 8 million readers in all vernacular languages in the country, English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil, with a staff strength of 100 people. Also coming in is Kamarul Bahrain Harun, Vice President and Editor-in-Chief of Astro Awani. He's a voice and a face you see very often on the news, of course. Kamarul says he's a lifelong believer in pursuing knowledge. And this born amongst the paddy field of perilous journalists, says entire two and a half a decade career in journalism and broadcasting has been driven by this chosen mantra of pursuing knowledge. Um, from humble beginnings as a reporter at News Straits Times to broadcast journalist, car magazine show presenter, producer at TV3, to Cyber Jaya, TV anchor producer, to Astro Awani editor-in-chief and anchor. He studied a broadcasting and believes that this pandemic that we're going through right now has caused new normal adaptation and offers a chance for the media industry to innovate and thrive on the disruptions of now and before. Also joining us, as I would like to coin Proton's PR Pro, Vijay Ratnam Tarumatnam, Director of Group Communications at Proton. Uh, Vijay has over 20 years in the communications industry where he's worked in a variety of roles, ranging from broadcast to banking, specializing in the areas of brand strategy and crisis. He's worked for both local and international brands, including Petronas, HSBC, and BMW. And he's come back here to Malaysia uh, just last year to head up the corporate communication at Proton after a five-year sabbatical and he says he's a self-confessed train geek and he's very interested to see the impact of digital revolution on social norms, human interaction and business. Also joining us is Andy C, President of the Public Relations Consultants Association of Malaysia, or PRCA, and Founder, Principal Partner, and Managing Director of Perspective Strategies. Andy is the founder of uh, this 
Strategic Communications and Issues Management Consultancy. He's a member of the PRGN, which is the Public Relations Global Network, one of the world's largest network of independent agencies. And he also runs his uh, own firm where he's forte in Strategic Communications Council and Issues Management has uh, had him worked with many important figures within uh, the industry. He also has worked with multinational as well as public and private listed companies. So there you have it. That's the list of all our panelists and a quick brief about them. Of course, so much more to say, but right now I'd like to bring on all our panelists, our speakers for today from Andreas to Premesh, Kamarol, Vijay and Andy. Let's have them on screen right now. Also a quick update. Uh, we have 425 participants at this point, about a hundred plus more to go. So while we wait for them to come on, let's bring on the first poll question. This is a question that we'd like all of you to answer. What are you seeking to learn from today's masterclass? Please feel free to answer these questions. It's everything from making content actionable to is being in depth too much and if storytelling is uh, powerful. We have a few answers coming in and on that note, I'll kick off to begin our discussion with my panel today. So once again, panelists, thank you very much. So much to say, I have so many questions here on this table. Let's first put into perspective the media landscape at this point of time, post COVID. When I say post, I mean, you know, that now that we've gone through this, uh, we are, you know, understanding what it's all about. We're also understanding what the new normal is. But from your own perspectives, perhaps you could all uh, tell us a little bit about how you're feeling the new normal is for the media industry uh, at large. Andres, I'd like to start with you. Just very quickly, we'll have to unmute Andres. Unmute, yes. Yes, there you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. An amazing um, panel and, 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 um, and, and discussion. Uh, thanks to Essentia. I hope everybody is safe and well and uh, coping with this mental game, uh, because partially that's what it is. Um, my take on your question, uh, Jesse, is that the world has changed forever and the paradigm has been broken. Not shifted, but completely broken. Uh, we live in a brand new world that is morphing as we uh, live day by day. It's changing and um, we have no other way but to embrace it, to see the positive aspects in it, and to really adapt ourselves and, and, and our ways of behaving and acting into what the new norms are. Um, the business has changed, and we know that very well. Uh, business who cannot adapt or they were not really ready for this, as if we were, uh, uh, many of them are closing down. Um, businesses who look into the future, they start to outline uh, serious strategies on how to change in order to stay relevant and to survive. Um, and this is not going to be uh, a short lived situation is going to be uh, a long one and uh, a, a changing world. So I think that uh, when we really look into this, we need to, number one, look at it positively. And I fundamentally believe in that because if we only look at it from a complaining standpoint, uh, it will not get us far. Uh, the situation is what it is and it will not go back uh, whatever happened uh, cannot be undone and we need to live in a new environment and therefore we need to see it positively and we need to really find out what are these uh, practices, these new ways of doing things, of thinking, of behaving, of acting that we make us winners into this new world, into this new paradigm. Um, so it's not all bad. Yes, terrible things are happening, but um, terrible things have happened before in the world from famines to uh, wars. And uh, uh, this is just a different kind uh, that right. brought humanity in a different way together. So it's right, up thanks. to us. Really. Premish, would, would you like to weigh in on this? What do you think the new normal is, uh, especially for an independent news portal like Malaysia Kini? Thank you. Uh, well, firstly, we have to recognize that things are changing, uh, which uh, Andreas has uh, alluded yeah. to. Um, but things are changing in an uncertain way. We do not know the pace of change, how fast things are going to change, what's going to remain the same, and what's going to change. So the situation is changing very differently. And we also need to understand that people 
uh, acclimatize themselves to this change at different rates. Um, you know, some people can go from one state to another state overnight and they are fine. Other people will not make that transition at the same pace, right? Um, there will be resistance, there will be objections. Uh, for example, uh, you know, now that the MCO is being eased off and we're telling people to come out and come back to work, but there's a lot of resistance, there's a lot of fear, you know, so, so um, it's not that people can, you know, the government says go back to work, everybody's going to come back and, and change. So I think that uh, uh, we need to understand where society is and where it's going to be, and then we need to position the media accordingly. So we live in a period of uncertainty. People are changing, but the rate of change is also uncertain and differentiated among yeah. uh, different audiences. So the media, in one sense, has to be able to provide information which helps them um, understand the situation, create more certainty, as well as allude as to what to come without being too speculative. Uh, um, we live in a situation where we ourselves don't understand the impact of the pandemic. So how do we provide enough information that they feel that they're being informed uh, wherever they are, and the audience are actually at very different places, uh, and at the same time, in a way, help them acclimatize and move forward with these changes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in, of course, from an internal organizational point of view, um, in a period of uncertainty, a media organization has to be very agile, has to be able to adapt quickly. Um, you know, if we have huge overheads and we have huge structures in place, uh, you know, we're going to be like dinosaurs and, and we're going to be wiped out. So I think, um, you know, internal agility is very important, as well as being able to assist society to adapt quickly at different rates that society is going to adapt. Right. Um, Astra Wani uh, Cam has obviously, you know, yes. is a big name and a household name as well, along with Proton, in fact, uh, Vijay. Uh, how do you see the new normal to be as a uh, information, uh, you know, point, a reference point for so many people across the country? Uh, they look to traditional media houses uh, to get their information on and verified information on a daily basis. What does the new normal look for? For a media owner like Esra Wani? Well, I guess the usual is dead. Boring is dead. Complacency is dead. Um, another thing that's dead is the attitude of just taking things and not thinking. You know, patronizing is dead. Pretty much so because uh, judging from the spike of um, audience attention to not just Esra Wani, you can look at the data it's all across the mainstream media. Um, and get, that gave us a good problem because Awani has been leveraging over the past few years into digital to be about 60 to 80 percent of our operation. But suddenly, TV numbers are also bad in quite a big way. So now we're small, but we've got to look at all this. But to answer your question uh, more directly, I, I believe that um, news has always been important. It's even more important now. Current affairs is even more important now because you cannot just treat the pandemic like any other thing that happened. This is unprecedented. So you've got to have multiple tier of information. The first tier is the, you know, uh, virus for dummies. What is it? SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what is the protein spike? All that needs to be there. It needs to be there from the very beginning and repeated again and again and again. Then the other level is the situational information and analysis. Okay, so how does that impact me? How does that impact my family? How does that impact my workplace and work colleagues and my city or my town or my campo or whatever it is? So that's at least the two things of uh, communication level that must be there. However, all that doesn't exist in a vacuum. The average level of this cost for a community, let's say national level of discourse, influences all those things. And if there's no appetite to really debate, if there's no appetite before this to really sift out things and have the appetite to go beyond A to B to C, then how do you explain epidemiol uh, you know, from an epidemiology side why you shouldn't shake hands? Why you shouldn't go back and meet your parents, which you have always done for Adil Fitri or Kaamatan or Gawai, where culture, religious norm suddenly goes to a block against the pandemic 
new normal, we need communication more and more. And it's not just one-way communication. It needs to not only inform, not only educate, but now it needs to be interactive so that the very intelligent community can sound back to the original source of information like the media, like Ezra Wani, and have a platform to really put these opinions and diversity of opinions across. And then automatically, almost, the viral stupidity of fake news will be irrelevant to that particular discourse and the real ones will stand out. So that's my point of view on that. <laughs> Thank you, Kamaro. Vijay, I'd like to bring you in right now. Proton, of course, a popular and national brand as well. From a PR Copcom perspective, uh, what do you think the new normal is for the industry and for household brands like yourself? Um, so, you know, First interesting thing is 25 years later, Kamarol is still espousing the same value sets that he did when I was sitting next to him. So that's a very refreshing. For the benefit thing. of the participants today, Kamarol and uh, Vijay uh, worked many, well, not so many years ago, lah. they worked together. Not so many, yeah. No, but I think what he said just now, a couple of things I want to pick up on. Um, first of all, we live in an era of what Baudrillard, the, the French, uh, psychologists talked about as hyper-reality. Because we are so inundated by all forms of media, from the point you wake up to the point you go to bed, you very rarely have a chance to form your own opinion. All right? It's somewhere. And what is really interesting for me about this pandemic, which obviously has been confirmed by these guys, is that when things go south and when you start to feel scared, you go back to the things that you trust. And ironically, the things that you trust end up being the very same thing that everybody said, oh, it's dead, i.e. the mainstream media. Because in this environment, you want veracity. And, if you, and there are very few places you will go to. I mean, yes, everybody's going to have their own bent, but we found that most people were going back to old titles, and sorry to use that term, I don't use it in a negative way, but the star, Awani. My mother watches uh, Awani more than any, you know, like, uh, I'm amazed. And she, she always turns around and she says, hey, wasn't he working with you? How come he still looks so young? Huh? But, you know, aside from that, and, you know, Malaysia Kini, um, which has run, I guess, in terms of being used to the pandemic, you can't beat Prameshla because, from day one, they have been fighting the juggernaut and sort of trying to survive every day. So the pandemic is probably just another day in business. I think for brands, what needs to happen is go back to being honest, right? If you don't have a point of view, don't try and be perfidious and jump on the thing. So you, you see now a lot of people having some sort of COVID-19 message, brands. Right? And the message is, stay safe, stay strong, wash your hands. Oh, really? Thanks for telling me that. I, I wouldn't have known otherwise. So when we get approached a lot and are asked for comments, at this point in time, if my boss or I or the company does not have a point of view, we don't say anything because there's enough information out there. But I think the key thing that a brand can do at this point is to be sincere. Do not jump on the CSR bandwagon because you will be found out very quickly, right? It's very spurious. So I think that the pandemic has been on some level good because it forces people to really think about what content they are digesting. I want to bring in Andy right now. Sorry, I need to keep you uh, silent for so long, about five minutes or so. Uh, but uh, of course, you also have so much to share with us. You wear two hats. You're uh, an in-betweener between the client, the advertiser, the brand versus media. Um, how do you weigh in on what you are seeing to be the new normal right now for the media industry? On the personal side, I have sort of a training before the real MCO started. I was in Chile during the civil unrest. So I experienced curfew back when I was in Chile. Uh, so, so the MCO was, was uh, I, I had sort of a rehearsal before everyone else. Anyway, it's, it's a very, uh, like, like what uh, uh, Andreas and Pramish mentioned, it's really something that's very, uh, it, it totally changes the whole dynamics. 
You know, in the past, many organizations that talk about health and safety is only uh, people who are in sensitive industries. But today, every organization has to have that health and safety element in, as part of the organization. Otherwise, you won't be able to convince any of your staff to go back to work in some form or another. So in that way, the whole narrative has changed. Uh, uh, what Vijay say is true, you know, the authenticity needs to, to uh, people need to go back to where they trust in terms of the, uh, the media channels that they trust. Uh, likewise, they need to feel comfortable. Uh, that, that's all, all changing the whole, whole environment. And uh, in that sense, the authenticity, the, the, uh, the ability to, to communicate meaningfully, all these are becoming more important for brands, organizations, and this doesn't, this, this kind of fundamental things become even more important as you know, the world sort of change and rock. And another thing would be very important here is while we have all talked about how important it is for us to digitalize, how important it is to transform, today, you know, everything is thrown away. If you don't transform, you don't digitalize, you, can't basic, you basically just can't get back to business because there's no way for you to operate if you still operate in the old world. So in a way, the whole thing has been accelerated and we just have to embrace it. Uh, there's no turning back, it's about moving forward. So I think in that way, all organizations, all media organizations, brand owners, agencies, we've got to operate in a whole new environment and uh, work together again to, to redefine how we're gonna work together to make things work for this new economic climate. So, so that's, that's what's gonna happen. And I see that uh, that will really transform and change. For example, media organizations need to change the way they interact with brands in the past. You know, in the past, you have editorial team, advertising team. Does that work anymore? I mean, that's a big question that all of us need to sit down and, and rediscuss. Likewise, uh, uh, brand owners as well, you know, they, they, the, 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 the space of earn, own media space is really going to be blurred now. Media organizations are struggling to survive. If everything is free, no one will be able to operate. So, I mean, that, those kind of questions now become a very fundamental question that all of us need to sit down, see how we can redefine the ecosystem and push it forward. So that, that's what I, I look at it as. Absolutely, Andy. Thank you to all our speakers for putting things in perspective uh, from your own point of views. But here's a question for everyone. Um, you know, as was mentioned, press like to talk about positivity, uh, especially during bleak times like this, what we're going through, versus brands uh, trying to be heroes or trying to do CSR or public service announcements uh, and, and, and appear as, you know, um, a an agent of, uh, of, of, of change. Having said that, and also having bring in the point that revenue still matters, let's go back to basics. Um, what is the content that matters to the media? What is it that will catch media's eye? From a media owner's perspective, like uh, Astra Wani, uh, Malaysia Kini, um, as well as from in-house brands, like Vijay and in between us like Andy and of course Andres who I think you've been on both sides before uh, you know so really like let's just go back to basics does press releases work anymore should there be a new version of a press release what are some of the highlights that need to be put in do you look at emails and then and then what determines whether you put them in the trash box and whether they stay in your inbox I mean what are some of these fundamentals or basics that you think has, is now different uh, coming out of a global crisis. Andres? Um, well, I've been sitting on both sides of the fence. Until recently, I've been um, in the position of uh, the groups here at the star. And before that, uh, pretty much all my life, I spent it on the, uh, on the agency side where uh, I would work very closely with the clients on uh, press release issues. Uh, even though we're not a PR agency, but still we would deal with the subject matter. I think looking at how the industry has changed throughout the years in many different markets and to talk about the last 14 here in Malaysia, the fundamentals don't really change. The fundamentals stay the same. So to me, when you talk about a story, a press release, um, you have to ask the fundamentally key question that will determine everything. And that is what value and what meaning does this press release carry? Why, uh, what's the purpose of this press release? And of course, from the client's point of view, for example, that has to be um, a story that needs to be told to your constituency, but to the media owner who is going to do that for you, 
unless it's a paid advertorial, um, that story has to have a value that really fulfills his or her purpose to his or her constituency. And if that is not there, it's not really going to work. So back to the fundamentals. What is the purpose? What value does this press release um, uh, service? And then we can talk about um, form. Then we can talk about different platforms. Then we can talk about how you can differentiate the press release to different media owners in terms of uh, 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 speaking their language language literally because it could be Chinese versus Bahasa versus English. It could also be style. So uh, NST versus the star, the style and the content is very different. So uh, you cannot have a cookie cutter approach and therefore one size fits all. It cannot be like that. It has to be tailor made, which requires time. And that has been a common mistake throughout the years in many different situations where you do one press release for one platform or two, and you disseminate the same thing to everybody. That doesn't work anymore. Fundamentally, again, we have to start with what purpose does this, uh, what value does this press release offer to whom you're sending it to, and then how you can really tailor make it to, um, uh, to, to fulfill the purpose that they are driving. Uh, mm -hmm. Only then, I think, can be successful. But back to the fundamentals. Andy? Right. Uh, I think uh, Andres is truly correct in terms of, you know, the news release is just a platform in which the news is disseminated. Ultimately, the core of the content remains uh, the most important thing. Once we decide what the story is, then we decide what the channels or platforms it right. could be. For example, if it's a hard sell story, obviously you can't expect the media to put it in an earned media space. So that's something that it's, you know, advertorial, or it could be on the company's own assets, you know, be it digital, be it their own website or social media site. So that's, that's, that can be, the, the platform can be determined later. But the story itself, the why, needs to be developed at the very beginning uh, in terms of the target audience that the brand is trying to reach. And from that, once we define that story, we try to also see where the media is from their perspective, um, in terms of what kind of story their readers want. So ultimately, I think the understanding the audience is very important. And then from there, we look at how we can create that alignment between the goals for the organization and also uh, the media organization. And of course, most importantly, we must be prepared to repurpose these content for across various platforms and channels. Uh, and of course, in today's context, we've got to leverage on the technology uh, and we also need to realize today's audience is different from audience years back. You know, you got to keep it short and simple uh, because right. the attention span is much shorter for the newer audience. So for example, we then need to decide some things can be in a long form, written format, but why infographics work today? Because the attention span of the younger generations is indeed shorter. shorter. Why they right. like to watch TikTok video over reading a long feature article? I mean, these are all things that we have to realize and then once we decide the story, then we can determine what are the platforms. Oh, this is suitable for a TikTok story. This is suitable for the mainstream media kind of story. But All the right. story doesn't change. That fundamental mm -hmm. thing doesn't change. Jesse, and I have a... Sorry, I was just going to say... Uh, I'll just jump in. Um, I have a very simple formula for deciding whether a story comes up or not. I want to talk about this in two parts. The formula is very simple. It's called CRAP. So to study whether a story should go to Cameroon, I first ask, is it current? If it's not current, why is it of interest to him? Number two, uh, is it robust? Does it have beyond whatever message you wanted to send? Does it have enough facts behind it to stand? Number three, is it, is it, does it articulate a point? Right? Very often you will see brands try to sell a story and they say, oh, this and that, but does it articulate a point? Because the key cell in storytelling is conflict, right? Any good story is about conflict. So there's, there's conflict and then you figure out how to solve that. So the, the articulating a point is very important. And the fourth one is proximity. And I don't mean that from a geographical standpoint, but just from mind, heart, does it resonate? Is it important then? So that's one. But the second thing that is even more important that our industry, at least from the PR perspective, doesn't do well 
is that we don't play the role of the boundary spanner. So um, these two comms gurus, Coombs and Halliday, they describe the PR person as the boundary spanner. Meaning your job is, remember it's, it's an asymmetric model. Your job is not just telling the public what your company wants to hear. Your job is really to go back to your boss and say, I'm sorry, cannot, you know? And um, that's been one of the most difficult parts of my job because obviously, as far as my boss is concerned, I will just want my product to look like this. And that's all I care about. But my job is to go back and say, guess what? They're not interested because, you know, in, in everybody's eyes, their child is the most beautiful lad. Right. right. So for, for, for me to go to camp, if it doesn't pass the crap test or to premish, then it won't leave my desk. So what you're saying is the onus lies on PR practitioners, corporate com, uh, in-house brands uh, to, to really crystallize and ensure that uh, what they're saying is they meet um, uh, the uh, crap criteria um, and only then uh, try and pitch that or share that with the media. So try and solidify the message internally first before pushing it out. Because otherwise you're disrespecting Cam and Pranish. You know, they are the fourth Who estate. Yeah? Don't have any time. Ex ex absolutely. So I'm coming to the point of fourth estate uh, to, of course, uh, Prem and Cam is, uh, from Astro Wani and Malaysia Kini. Uh, you obviously receive so many different types of, you know, emails and content wanting to make their way through your doors. And so coming from what Vijay has pointed out, CRAP and being a boundary spanner or the acronym of CRAP rather, um, what are what makes it through your door? What makes the content that you are proposed with get published? Cam? Okay. Um, well, first of all, you know, Malaysia Kini tends to be very narrow, right? We do a lot of politics, a lot of current affairs, right? Uh, we do some environmental issues, climate change, but whenever often it's linked to some sort of political situation. So perhaps, you know, Malaysia Kini is less sensitive to content coming from brands and other content. Uh, we have branded content, we have announcements pages, other sections where this content can come about. But I think for me, um, we, really like to, we really like to see content, uh, content coming in, which is part of the public conversation. So what's in the mind of the public and how is this content resonating with what is going on with the public and what are the public concerns? So for example, you know, there is COVID-19, but a lot of the public are also concerned about schools what's happening in our schools. Uh, a lot of it, uh, people are concerned about what's happening in our wet markets, uh, you know, uh, the situation there. A lot of people are concerned about you know, clearing of forests. There's so many other concerns as well, which are associated with our current situation. So how are brands part of this um, conversation? And brands, um, you know, tend to kind of jump on it straight away when there's, a, when there's something going on, or, or sometimes they just stay away. But they can also, you know, position the organization, you know, sponsor a program, sponsor a talk, do a webinar like this, have a conversation with other opinion and thought leaders about the method, what they're talking about. They are, you know, I think for me on the scale of one to 10, the press release is about a one and there were nine other things that, that should be done. You know, uh, Which is um, what? Which are, what? What are those nine other things, Prem? Well, I think, uh, you know, if you can get a story to go viral, of course, then media often picks up that story, which actually goes, goes viral, it's being discussed in the public, that's one. Second thing, you know, work on, on programming, on shows, on content, uh, which people are interested in. You can use your, you can even use your, you know, your warehouse, your shop lot, your bar, your factory as a backdrop to showcase something, uh, you know, do videos, do interesting content, infographics, there's so many other things that you can do. Do interview with your CEO, how is the CEO and, um, and his family coping? Or how are your, how are your workers in your factory coping with, 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 uh, with COVID. So there's so many other things that you can do. And I think that you don't, you don't al always have to target your customers as the sole focus of your PR. Um, you can do something with your employees and show that you're a responsible employer, right? And they will get the message out to others. So right. there's often a very indirect way to show that you are a credible brand, that you stand for something, that your brand is authentic, you know? In a way, it joins the conversation and resonates with your with your customers without you know they becoming like you know a hot it's like kind of a cold uh, you know a much softer sell rather than a hard sell. I think of being a bit more creative and being a bit more open to how 
getting the message across, it's much better than being pretty much straightforward with a, with a press release. Kamara, I'd like to bring you in right now to sort of recap and give your insight on this question. Now I know, but I never get personally a press release from Proton. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, and I still drive a 1985 Proton Saga Orient Indian version. Come on. So, um, RB2002, correct? Exactly the point. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go to it this way. If news and information is love, press release is just a once in a while love letter. Uh, how does the press release stand to a WhatsApp message? How does the press release stand to a wedding ceremony? A press release only comes at the convenience of the institution and organization. Mark that against the fact that since TKP has begun, in fact, even before, in the infamously called Sheraton move, Ezra Awani has almost been on a breaking news mode almost every single pillar of the day, morning, afternoon, and evening. How would a press release work in that cycle? It's just not going to be our staple. Now, that's just from a frequency, quantitatively speaking, right? Let's look at qualitative. I need to fill in almost every hour news for at least 15 to half an hour on TV. I need at least 20 to 60 stories online plus micro ones and listicles for social media. Where, of course I want content, right? But the thing is, the press releases are not talking about the love that I want. The press release is talking and selling to me a love that most of the time I do not need because it's not about me. It's about the people. How many press releases put people first at the center of the message? It's always about a company, an organization, or an initiative and event. The only press release I remember for this year, I cannot say the name, but the press release impressed me because 90% of it can straight away, when I look at the press release, I can straight away see a new story in it. And most of the facts and information in it I have not known. All I need to do is just verify it, then I can hit publish or I can put it on air. So the point here is, after the Mad Men, and now we know from the drama series in the 60s, did what they do, you now need a new sane man to give out not only press releases, but a new love. For example, in the PKP and PKPB, most brands do not talk about how do you empower people. You talk about what you give. For example, go online. But the moment I go online, my choices went down to 10% if it's Bazaar Ramadan, for example. Not only do my choices went down by 90%, the prices went up by two to three times. And that's against the value of Ramadan that I have because I'm supposed to be more worry about what I spend and it's not about spending a lot, for example. So there's a mismatch between the concept of sending out press releases and the content of the press releases that newsroom need. And this is not because the SOP of the newsroom, but because newsroom now needs to be right at the coattail of the masses and what they want. And right now, what they want being cooked up for the majority of people, majority of time in their houses are many, many things which the press releases are not answering either qualitatively or quantitatively. I'd like to take you, uh, Ken, from what you've said and for all, for all the insights from our speakers today to the poll question up here on the screen. I hope everyone can see. The question we have asked is, what have your challenges been in providing content to media? 49% are saying not an advertiser of the media, therefore their content isn't relevant. 59 being the majority here are saying lack of interest, no response from the media. Um, media <laughs> heads, uh, uh, Cam, Premish, uh, even Andy, Andres, Vijay as well, to get your feedback. What do you do when there's no interest from the media? You've crafted your story, but a great press release. You've got a brand to sell. It's about the people, but it's not being picked up. Um, or there has been no interest from the media. 
What do so, you do? So let me jump in with that. So I go back to crap, right? Now you say you've written a beautiful press release. If you're, it's it's um, there's a guy who wrote a book called The Story Brand, and he likens how most people make this mistake of trying to make their brand the hero of the story, when what you should do is make the customer the hero of the story. And as a brand, so he uses the example of Luke Skywalker, right? So Luke Skywalker is the protagonist in Star Wars, and Luke Skywalker has this nemesis, Darth Vader, who he has to fight. And so Yoda comes in to help him. And he says that brand should learn to be Yoda, not Luke Skywalker. Now, to answer that question, if Cam or Premish don't look at your story, guess what? It's not good enough. He just told you he's got so much space for content. But if if the main part of your story is I my product is so good, people who buy it will be so lucky, you will be so comfortable, and you'll end up rich at the end of the day. How is that a new story? Where's the hook? I'll give you an example. Many years ago, um, with another brand, one of the issues was that women weren't buying this particular product. And what I found was that they hadn't been given access to this product. So all I did was I went to editors of female sections and I said, would you do this? And they said, oh, but we're not specialists in this. I said, but you buy this product, right? Yes, you have an opinion, go ahead. And the next thing you know, we built a whole new arsenal of stories simply because we asked the question, what does the reader want? So I'll sum it up like this, right? I always, this is my acid test. Will I want to read the story or not as a consumer? And is it honest? And if I don't, then the answer is cannot. Thanks, Vijay. Andres? Oh, um, well said, Vijay. Um, to, I guess uh, I would go a little bit um, uh, back uh, in time. And I would ask the question, have you built that relationship with the particular media owner that you are expecting to do your press release? Um, many times, I think everything contributes to it, right? So what relationships have you developed in the past with the different media owners? What value have you added to the business? Um, and of course, uh, the 49% to the answer of the poll is also critical. I had this experience many times in my recent jobs in my recent job, that um, advertisers who would never have advertised before, now they have the expectation of running press releases. And so if you haven't really built the relationship, and it goes both ways, how can you expect? It is about value, and it is about value for my customer. If I am the star, if I am Avani, if I am um, Malaysia Kini or whatever, NST, then does it create something valuable to my readers, to my audience? Then it will be of value to me. And uh, also, does it really uh, make my job easier as a reporter, as a writer, as a news editor? Because many times I've seen so many, the majority of press releases, they just send it and expect. They expect you to vet it, expect you to rewrite it, expect you to do the job, which is not really going to happen that easy unless there is uh, some other reason to do so. So do you make the job of the editor easier? Do you add a, a value that he can give or she can give to, uh, to her audience? Uh, and have you built that relationship over the years? Many times PR agencies work, like the, uh, the one Andy uh, does. One of my favorites is Go Communications with Peter De Kretzer, who is one of my gurus in PR. And he, he tries to do exactly that. So have you done all these steps before you go and to simply demand? If none of that is, and if a VJ's principle of crap is not there, I love that by the way, VJ, um, I'm gonna use it and steal it with pride, then you're not gonna go anywhere. How can you go and demand? So you need to build the relationships, you need to add value, you need to make the job easier, um, and you need to make sure that um, you tailor make your story, which fundamentally has to have a lot of love, like uh, like Kamaru said, um, uh, in order to uh, in order to succeed. How do you change the uh, media can, perspective? For example, maybe, yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe ahead. I can just mention a few things. I I know that you know there are a lot of PR uh, people in in uh, in this chat, 
And often the problem is that the pushback is from the client, right? The client is conservative. The client just say, send out a press release, you know, don't do anything creative, you know? So it, it is difficult. It is difficult when um, clients do not, um, do not appreciate the difficulties that PR companies and PR people have. So I think that, uh, like Andrea said, it, it is a process that uh, we have to work with our clients very early uh, in order to uh, show them different examples of what works, what doesn't work, you know, get them on board. If they don't trust you as a PR company, as a PR person, if they don't trust your creative instinct, if they don't allow you to build a relationship with the media, then, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, and then, so, so I think it is both uh, understanding the media, but also working with clients for, um, for them to open up a new ways of thinking. Sorry. Andy, Kamaru, any points to share this, uh, yeah. this question? You know, right now, we are uh, still, am I, still, you hear me? Right? And right, we'll just go with Kamaru first, Andy. I'll, I'll okay. come back to you in a couple of minutes. Sure. Yeah. You see, we've got the climate right now in our country where a lot of appointments are being done. Not just the public sector, but also the private sector. And then you have a press release saying that so-and-so is now the CEO and we'd like to thank the old CEO or whatever, MD or chairman. But no one speaks about why is this person suitable for the job? The press release to me should put that first because of the pandemic, because of the new normal. Hence, we believe Jesse Chahal is the best CEO for or chairman for Bernama. <laughs> right? Then, then at least that's a story I can write. But if it's just, uh, you know, so and so, 60 years old, 40 years of experience will now be picked to be put there, it doesn't go to the next level. It's not news. I think the PR Newswire recent uh, survey of 1,000 journalists in Asia Pacific, and when they look at Malaysia and Vietnam, I think the journalists put content first as the quality that they seek for in any press releases. Singapore and I think Hong Kong look more at um, audience shape, whether that press release will gel with the audience. So either way, it cannot just be the traditional press release anymore. If everyone else has to go new normal, why are press releases still the old normal? Well, 25 years ago, when I was still with BJ Greenhorn in, in Three Pentas, for example, it was the same style. Just change the date, change the names, change the name of the company, then you still got the same thing. Right. Andy, what are you seeing between yeah. from the client uh, side uh, and media? Uh, thanks, thanks, Jesse. Um, I think we've been focusing too much on press release, but I think in defense of my PR professional friend, profession friends uh, in the corporate co in-house or, or agencies, uh, press release is not the only tool we use. And to be honest, press release is uh, it's more of just a quick announcement. You know, it doesn't involve in building the story and so forth. I think the credit must be given in terms of the profession now because of the things that have changed so much. Like you say, the old traditional love letter is not going to work alone. Uh, it's about how we work together to build stories together. I mean, I, I like Premish's idea. You know, I think it's about uh, the new age corporate comms person would then see that. If it's a straightforward announcement, yes, some things still need to be news, news release driven because it's the timeliness of the announcement. It's the very pertinent information that needs to get out on the media in a wide, uh, a one, one, one shot kind of announcements. I mean, for example, it's a public announcement that is relevant for, for everyone. But if it's about building brand stories, about uh, certain ad stories, then it's going to be about our partnership. You know, uh, That's where I, I see a lot of role for corporate comm or PR professionals to work with their friends in the media to sort of build those stories together because I think it's of mutual benefit. Likewise, the media as well needs the support of brand owners and organizations, particularly in the challenging economic environment right now. So this is so, where I think- So Andy, I, I, I like the point you're making. You're saying brands, advertisers, media need to come together, collaborate. I mean, and that's been done in the past and it needs to be even more now, more so now. Mm -hmm. I think it's a Actually, lot of okay, I have to jump in there. I think that shouldn't happen. And I think that's why we're in the mess we're in. It's because of collaboration. Hey, you buy this ad, I like, get that story. And I'm sorry, I, I mean, I guess maybe because I started on the media, I think that's an affront, you know? 
we, I, and Andy, I'm sure you'll agree with me, a good story is the greatest value you can get. And you know how hard you've had to work to make that story. And the, the thing that really rains on my parade is when people think, oh, the PR guy, like your PR, very good. You know what they think that means? That means I can go and call Cam and we go to Starbucks and have a frappuccino. And so I don't, I don't, get, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, say, Andy, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I know that. That's that cheap, question. only a frappuccino. <laughs> No, but anyway, the, the point is, I think that's the reason why in this time of panic, you see people going back to Malaysia, Kini, Star and Astro Wani. Because these are places where you know that there is some amount of news value. La. Let's be realistic. Huh? Today, anybody with a laptop is a journalist. Okay? They don't go through the rigor that... Uh, older institutions had where there's a there's a process there's a thinking there's an understanding about i mean as i think as journalists you guys will look at a press release and immediately can smell the pong of commercialism and it's going to go out the door I, i'm going to say i'm going to say this to that i mean do you ever discuss fake news on television you know you only say fake news for social media online but that's why social media is popular so it's there to stay. But the point here is, I think if we're going down this road, the power equation must be discussed here. Gone are the days when a PR executive like VJ are on, will only be given here, everything is decided by the board or the senior management, go out there, polish this, and make sure the media loves us and the people will take this in. Look, this is the third decade of the 21st century. The PR decision must be there at the board level and also at the senior management level. Then only it has power to carry through whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on a press release. I'll give you one example. In January in Davos at the World Comic Forum, the theme is about stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism. I'm sorry, Brother Sai Mohammed, I love you, but I saw at the chat room in the Zoom, you're saying that CREP stands for Clients Requires Actual Profits. We are talking about actual profits. The old traditional press research doesn't give profit to anyone much. The new one, the new transparent, people-centric, people-first approach, shareholder capitalism, as they call it at the World Comic Forum, that's the way to go. How many pharmaceutical companies are now talking about the availability or access to COVID-19 vaccine once we have it? So what? If you let the big companies have it for only profit, we, the middle income and lower, middle, lower income countries, what? We, we, we're going to have more people die first before we can afford to have access to it? So these are the topics that matter. And I do not believe that a press release in this day and age only to get favors with the media and the people, I believe it should be the deeper inner voice of any companies and any organization. I think, I think... Yeah, I wanted to clap too. <laughs> I mean, it's not, not debate. I, 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 I agree with you, Vijay, and I agree with you, Kamaro. There, there, are, there are different aspects to a brand story. I mean, for example, things that are for public interest, then that is of editorial uh, newsworthiness. There are certain stories that are a little bit on the sell side. That are those are for other forms of brand stories that will appear not in the news segment of Astro Awani, but in other segments, for example, a feature segment or a scientific discovery. So these are the things that perhaps uh, VJ, where the brand owners and media organizations can work together. I think that's, that's, that's important to define uh, and, and clarify. It's not about putting fake news on the uh, main news of the day, but it's about how do we then craft out various stories and what goes into a news release. What are those typical news that you would just put it on your website, for example, product information, you know, those, those things as an organization, you need to put it out there. But what are those other things that, for example, the, the, the very deep uh, uh, public interest things, then those are things that we, we can, uh, that is differentiated from the other point of view. So yeah, that's, that's my view. Cam, when you were making your point, I suddenly thought of Thomas Jefferson when he said, the basis of our governments being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. You know, that's why the Republican ousted him. Okay, but never mind. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You see, I understand the difficulty of the account executive, right? But if you look at it, one account executive to look after five client or four client and to maintain the pressure of getting the message through, I think it's a bit outdated right now. Like I said, what's news in the morning for Astrowani by noon is no longer news because there's another development that happened. So to keep up with that, the press release and the relationship has got to be on parallel. Right now, it's like it's on different tracks. Um, I understand what Andy is saying. And Andy is the guy who helped Awani got recognized by PRCA. But that recognition was for credibility of our reporting during general election 14. And I want to tie this back here where people first credibility must be imbued in, into any communication nowadays, especially in the pandemic era. Look, yes. New Zealand has done well, right, for, for COVID management. Taiwan has done well. But Malaysia, people seem to forget that we had the political change also at almost the same time where we are starting to worry about the pandemic in our country. So it's a two train track. So if any communication just address one, it's like hanging us in the lurch to make sense of it in the real reality for the grassroots out there. I'm just saying. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm going to do a quick time check. It's 3.37 on the clock. We were meant to end at 3.30. We did take some time to start uh, a bit uh, later as, uh, you know, as we had planned. But I want to bring up the polls again. Uh, this is the first, uh, the second poll question. Let's take a quick look at the first poll question and what the numbers are on that. Meanwhile, we've got about 22 questions from uh, our uh, participants for today. And I wanted to particularly address one question for all of you to jump in. And this question is really simple. It's asking, with the rise of new media, will all media be replaced? Vijay, you said and reiterated that at this point, you would go back to household names, uh, you know, like uh, TV3 or um, Esra Awani. But um, again, there's new media, which are quick reads, infographics. It's on the go. People are tuning into that and getting their news from that. So... Will all media be replaced then? So I, I guess I'll jump in quickly before anyone else. It's a question of how you're going to define old and new, right? So here we're not talking about whether the publication's been ar around a long time, etc. But I think, think about how you consume news or information. You'll get it on a WhatsApp, you'll get it somewhere. And if it intrigues you, where will you go and check it? Malaysia Kini, Estrowani, Star. So I think that uh, if you talk about the demise versus whatever, maybe the form in which you used to see it will be different. But veracity, credibility, because there, there's basically five principles in PR that Parsons talked about. He talked about uh, veracity, he talked about non malfeasance beneficence, he talked about uh, you know, confidentiality. These are the core rules, and they have never changed in 100 years of PR. There are reasons why there are some organizations that you still go back to for the quote-unquote truth. Now, as businesses, those organizations will have to change and they will have to evolve if they want to survive. I think if they lose out, it's not because people have lost uh, interest or are, are more susceptible to fake news, etc. Right? But it's holding on to that legacy. Right? So I think that there will be, the, the shakeup is there, okay? The shakeup is going to be completely different. But people will want to go back to a institution or a house that they believe in. So the one thing that has never changed is what uh, Cam talked about. Lah. Can you be bought? If you cannot be bought, you will find a way to survive. Right. Furthering this, this question from Hanis, uh, and she says, on building relationships uh, with the media, what can be done to strengthen relationships uh, with uh, an editor, for example, a journalist? How or what are some of the strategies um, that can help build this a uh, good relationship so that your, your story gets um, some light of day? Beyond Frappuccino. <laughs> No, no, I mean it. I mean, you know, you know, that's just a meeting, but but a relationship is beyond just a meeting, like it's about credibility and trust. 
I have to trust you as a source. I have to trust you as somebody that can, you know, be differing in opinions, but will still give me the true side from your point of view. The role of the media is not to agree with any one person. The role of the media for me is to yeah. collate as many viewpoints and as many truths out there. Because I used to believe when I was young and green that there's only one truth. But lo and behold, that's the beauty about Malaysia, diverse so much that there's diversity of truth. So you got to have so many for the people themselves to make up their mind informed decision to be taken. So if you're asking about relationship, I believe that is way beyond just that scheduled meet in an annual calendar that many people seem to have uh, to do. You know, it's, more, it's, it's going beyond that. Remember, 70% of the focus of people in Malaysia is not to the mainstream media, to me or to Prem or to, to the star or to uh, the, the rest is to Google and Facebooks and YouTubes of the world. So we now are the minority in the life of a consumer because their languages, the world and the ecosystem that they know, the bigger ones, the bigger parts are in there. So once we go out on our own platform, we cannot disregard that side of the story. So if you're asking for relevance of relationship, I'm also begging the point that the relevant is when you coin any messaging for your client, that messaging needs to take into cognizance the other things that has happened before you coin that message. It cannot come in disregard to anything else. We are not living in a bubble and more and more. It's more integrated either nationally, regionally or globally. So these are my points. You know, if you know that we are a majority Muslim nation and right now the heightened state of politicking means there's more issues of religion and race and suddenly you know your client has this issue with BDS, this boycott uh, movement, and suddenly you're pushing that brand out at a moment when that issue is high. So that is what I mean. You know, the relationship is not just about an editor to a PR company. The relationship must all be, all, all also must be filled by this new reality and this new relationship. Andy, so, what, how, how do you weigh in on this? Andreas, Prem, uh, Vijay, please feel free to jump in as well. Okay, I'll, um, I'll jump in very quickly on that. It's beyond cappuccino, which actually, I, or even frappuccino, I've never bought you one. Um, okay, in all fairness, it goes back to, again, we talk about fundamentals. How did I used to do this before? Very simple. If I am targeting a particular journalist, how do I make myself of value to him? I figure out what are the things, what are the stories he's going after? What are his pet subjects? You know, for example, if I'm going after Cam, okay, I, I, obviously I have inbound knowledge, but I know that he loves his geopolitics and stuff like that. So I will go and research and think about things around geopolitics and I will try to frame my story in that vein. And then I know that Cam will at least look at it. Or, and I've done this in the past, um, it may have nothing to do with the client or it may have nothing to do with the brand, but I, I find something that I know Cam will like because it's his area of interest. I'll send it to him. I make myself a resource for him so that the next time when I do have something to say to him, he might listen to me. And I mean, it's, to be honest with you, the, there's one part of, of good corporate communications that a lot of the uh, younger set probably haven't learned. Andy will jump on me because I think he'll agree. And that is that this profession is old-fashioned hard work. You have to sit down, you have to understand your brand, then, you know, you have to understand your customer. In this case, your customer is the journalist. What, what uh, tickles their fancy, you know? What floats their boat? Figure that out and then package it. And I promise you, you will be able to sell any story. Right. I mean, just to jump in a bit, uh, on Jesse, I think the way how relationships are built are also different. I mean, in the old days, you know, it's through a cup of coffee or a glass of beer. But in today's context, you also have newer journalists who are in the digital age kind of guy. They don't want to meet you. They want you to text them, you know. So it's really a very a subjective matter. You got to know who you're targeting. Uh, you know, you will know there are some uh, PR professionals now 
who build their relationship through social media with some of the editors because they, they communicate by, I mean, that's the new way. So you will also see couples nowadays don't talk to each other when they sit in the front of the, I mean, of course now social distancing, but I mean, uh, who don't talk to each other and they, they message each other. So it really depends on who we're trying to reach, who the target person is. I think just like uh, your customers or your, your, your friends, the way you interact with each and every one is different. So we've got to see how, who that person is. But I think most importantly is that, yeah, we're going to be someone that is reliable, someone that is trustworthy. Uh, I mean, those fundamental core principles of any relationship doesn't change. How we do it, it's really very debatable. There's no right or wrong. It really depends on who you're trying to talk to or engage with. I'll just frame, I'll let you guys weigh in. Uh, we are 15 minutes uh, running, uh, you know, out of time. Uh, but uh, for those who can't stay on the call, I think many have logged off as well. We still have 356 participants. So many people still all years. Um, Andres, perhaps we start with you. Prem, feel free to jump in as well. Uh, Prem, I know you're answering a question here on the Q&A box and, uh, you know, looking at uh, other content that may be out of the political sphere as well. And you say you're more than happy to look at those kind of content? Yeah, we actually do a lot. I mean, you look at Kini TV, we have a lot of different programs. We work in a program called Kini Halal. We're looking at business programs. Uh, we've got a program which we work with Digital News Asia called Top in Tech. Uh, so especially on the video side where the audience, the, you know, the audience is much more broader, we've got a huge variety of topics. So often, you know, you can always pitch us an idea uh, rather than telling you the press release and saying, this is what I want to carry, saying, you know, Prem, um, my company is going to be doing this in the next six months. Or well, this is what our strategy is for 2020. How can we work together on this? You know, and it can be a mix of news pieces, videos, many, many, many things. Um, but that's much more interesting where we try to bring value to our readers as well, rather than you know a one-off, one-off thing. So we're very, uh, you know, very open to issues that uh, people care about, they are invested in. Um, you know, more, more than happy to look at all those issues. I guess you've been quiet for way too long. <laughs> I'm distilling. I think uh, I, I, uh, to this question, um, I have a 25-minute answer, but I'm not going to give it now. So, you know, in the interest of time. Um, jokes aside, uh, if I am to distill everything that everybody has said, uh, it distills down to just, just a couple of words, and that is adding value. I think it distills down to that no matter how we twist and turn it. Uh, if it adds value to me as the editor, if it makes my life easier, if it gives me content that enriches my customers, my readers, my viewers, then I'm going to consider it. If it is written a way, uh, in a way that um, will allow me to uh, give a different experience to my readers, I will consider it. If it is a strict press release that uh, is a cookie cutter approach for all, uh, then it will be more difficult. And um, uh, when my editors are flooded uh, with press releases from every possible brand every single day, uh, they have other things to do too. So if I am to distill everything that everybody, Andy, Prem, BJ, Kamarul has said, it is all about adding value and nothing else. If it does that, it will go through. If it doesn't do that, it will not go through. And it is as simple as that. We don't need to say more. Add value and you're gonna get the job done and the press release published. All right, gentlemen, um, I have one question to ask you before I let you go. Um, there were you know, questions of media literacy that I wanted to highlight as well. And use, using that as a stratagem, I mean, apart from brands and advertisers and tagging it towards you know, ROIs, um, what role does media literacy play or where does it sit in terms of content consumption and creation? Uh, and so independent newsrooms or journals as well can spur conversations like this so Prem, where do you think we sit as a nation in terms of uh, media literacy? Uh, 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 Kim, you can also come in with this, please. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot to be desired regarding to media literacy. I think the number one issue we have is that a lot of information gets shared on WhatsApp. Uh, and a lot of information may not be accurate, may not be fair. Um, 
And most readers cannot differentiate between what's a comment piece and what's an opinion piece and what's a news piece. So, you know, we often get, uh, get uh, scolded for, you know, some of the views in our comment section of Malaysia Kini or, you know, comments that people put out. Um, so I think there needs to be a very, very big investment in, in generating media literacy uh, in order for people to understand, you know, what's, what's really out there and, and how do you distinguish between something which is true and not. Um, I think the government, brands, the media, all of us have to invest to develop this media uh, literacy. It's also part, uh, uh, as the uh, acting chair of the pro tem committee for the Malaysian Media Council, media literacy is very big on our agenda to try to you know, get people to appreciate and be able to differentiate between fair news, accurate news, and uh, you know other uh, more biased news. Um, I'll, I'll come to that this way. Oh, by the way, Prem, good to know that the pro tem committee is still on. Um, <laughs> <not sure. laughs> um, if, if you look at it, um, I need everything. If you can give me a well done 3D motion flying effects graphic of information, I'll take that too. Whatever that helps to bridge the gap of information to the people. Personally, and this is not Astro Omni's research, this is my own personal opinion. I believe that we have gaps in uh, approaching the pandemic. It's because of this is one issue that we have no choice but to look at it from the scientific approach first, then only look at other aspects. But just as the facts have proven, the interest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in our nation has gone way down. And there's a correlation there. That's why the main, more viral issues about the pandemic will be the more political ones, the ones that are associated with the politicking and the political forces. I, I get BJ when, no, how much more, how do you wash your hand messaging that you can see? But if one brand decided to invest on the scientific aspect of that, how does using so kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus because it doesn't have a skin, it can pe penetrate the membrane layer to the single protein cell. I mean, microscopically, visually, and on the text is talking about that. Then people would understand more or empathize more with that call to wash our hands. And how many people understand what cytokine storm is? The main issue of the virus getting into your lungs is that it will trigger your lungs and your body to overreact and suffocate your own body defense system. Your own healthy cells are killing your cells, for example. But when I discuss that on air and when I look at the interactions coming back, you know, it, it's too far for the majority in a sense. So whose fault is that? It's all our fault. Everyone has got to partake in this for the literacy that Prem has said. Having said that, at the same time, because we cherish democracy, under the Multimedia Act 1998, which broadcast is entirely on that and also online, any single complaint about any single thing that me, Prem, or any of our journalists put will also warrant an investigation. And if I don't like Malaysia Kini, I will have a group of people, for example, just complaining every day and they'll be inundated with answering from whoever, MCMC or whatever it is. So this, in this ecosystem is what we're talking about. You know, If you're complaining about the journalists not having time to take your call or to attend your event, we have to look at anything that is practical because the hunger for information, for clarity, and for credibility and trust is by the second nowadays, no longer by prime time news at night. Uh, sorry, I was just going to jump in. That's also because you guys, I, Awani and Malaysia Kini, are probably the only two houses that are actually interested in the idea of discourse. Otherwise, discourse is anathema to most people. And I guess, yes, in on some level, it's our responsibility to raise that understanding and awareness but i just want to pick up this point about how you 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 educate about media and all that it's, it's very important that corporate com or pr is part of the ruling coalition within a company you have to sit in there and you know because obviously somebody like say andreas is a ceo as far as he's concerned i want to make my sales numbers i don't care how you get the story 
But somebody needs to sit down and say, sorry, Andreas, I'm picking you because you're the CEO. You need to turn around and say, but Andreas, if you do that, we will lose currency and our brand will go down. And then, you know, you have to argue that point. I, I'll give you a recent case in point. We put in a new filter in some of our cars. It's, got, it's an N95 filter. So you can imagine the marketing and sales boys were like, oh, and I said, no way. I said, you can talk about it from the perspective of it helps you breathe, etc. No problem. But if there's even a, the slightest smell of a link to COVID-19, I will, I will go and report you to Kamandrian to, and say you're laughing. So they all have a bag. But that's important, right? It's important that you instill a sense of integrity internally, not just because you don't want to get caught, because that's the only way your customer will eventually trust you. Vijay, Vijay, my point to that, if I may, is it also due to the fact that one of the KPIs for PR practitioners is how many acreage they get in news reports or everything else. So sometimes it's more influenced by that because the qualitative impact is yes. for uh, our brand keluar hari ni dekat news, you know, rather than what impact does it has on the people? And now with sentiment data analytics, you can actually track the conversation throughout. Exactly. exactly. But how many people could really do that? No, they don't do that. And there's another, and there's a diabolical side to this. Uh, I, 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 brought a, I wrote a piece about it. I call it Orwellian marketing. And this is the use of cyber troopers, which is, I, and I know I, I have marketing friends who say, you're a dinosaur, you can't say that. But the point is this, right? The internet is supposed to be a free space and people read it and they, le they look at comments because they believe that, oh, okay, that's the truth. But cyber trooping is an insidious thing, especially when companies mask themselves and go in and basically what they're doing is they're cheating the average punter because the average punter is going to think, oh, this is another guy. Oh, he said, oh, this car, very good. Okay, okay, okay. You know, if you had any integrity at all, you put your hand up, but okay, like, that's a whole other subject. We, we won't go there now. That's why, having said that, before we end, I just want to put my last point is data. If you guys send to me any data, because in this country is very tough to get data, I will drink it straight away. I will leave the frappuccino. I'll take your data. <laughs> <laughs> if that's one key takeaway today, no more frappuccinos, data. Uh, gentlemen, of course, we have uh, run uh, way ahead of time at 3.58. Uh, I've only been given a few more minutes, uh, you know, permission to carry on this conversation. Very quickly, I want to, if each of you could summarize today's discussion, as well as look into what are some of the fundamentals or the pillars that will help to shape this industry's future as we move on, whether it be the new norm or how the, in, uh, the industry has evolved, what have been our key learnings coming out of this crisis, um, what are some of your opinions weighing into this? Uh, Andres, again, I'd like to start with you and go in sequence and uh, hopefully we'll be able to end in a couple of minutes. I think um, I'll link it. I will, I will summarize it back to the value. Um, if we really want to um, stay relevant and successful in, uh, in this business as PR uh, operators, then we need to ensure that we create the relationships we foster them uh, and we add value to the journalists. We add value to the media. Um, and we, uh, I believe, elaborated a lot uh, on that. Um, also, um, to make an extra point to that one, which it, it, it's, a, it's a big one, but uh, on the client side, I believe that uh, when it comes to the PR component, they really need to give it a better standing and make it uh, in the boardroom, put the PR in the boardroom where uh, they really um, uh, get a space to um, live and breathe the brand. Um, so adding value and um, gathering data, providing that over Frappuccino, as Camarul said, um, is by far uh, very, very important. If we add value, we will uh, go a long way. Uh, make sure that we uh, make their job easier. Remember that one size does not fit all. It has to be tailor-made approaches that fit not only the platform. It could be video, it could be bite-sized approach, it could be hashtags, it could be traditional media, 
uh, approaches, but it also uh, respects uh, the style and form of the publication itself, of the medium itself. So it has to be through all that and adapt to the new world. The fundamentals, they absolutely the same. Adding value, despite of what the form and what the medium and what the platform is, will really win the game moving forward. Prem? Yeah, I think that, you know, building relationship with the, with the media, uh, moving away from the press release, uh, thinking out of the box, uh, working early with the media, uh, those are some of the other, other fundamentals. Making, understanding what the conversation in the public is about uh, and being part of, of that public conversation, uh, standing out. Uh, just to add, you know, your PR among your own employees, among your vendors, among your suppliers, uh, the whole ecosystem of which your company is in is very, very much more important and often neglected in terms of comparison with the PR uh, for your customers. So invest in all those areas. Make sure your own employees are your champions. And I think in terms of measurement, I think, uh, you know, uh, this idea of moving away from measurement in terms of column inches and articles come out. And I'm sure I, I, I Cynthia, our, our host today, can, you know, think about it and, and say, okay, what, what better measurement of PR can, can be established and then help the industry move in, in that direction. Right, uh, Andy, what, what, uh, what, what would you say as a summary to all our discussion today as well as looking at uh, what the industry's future might be like? I think uh, uh, it's too simplistic to look at, you know, PR is media relations. It's only one component of the many, many things. Ultimately, uh, the comms person needs to be sort of the content developer, the storyteller, the communication strategies of the organization. And that's why it's important to be at the, at, the, at, the, at the top management level because it's about building that stories. Then from there, we can decide, oh, this story is suitable for the media. This is not a media story. This is for our own digital assets, you know, social or, or, or other platforms. These are for direct engagement because we are going to talk to the customers using these messages. So these are the things that I think it's very important for us to understand and differentiate. And this is where the communication strategies play a role, including me as a consultant, or VJ as an in-house person, we need to go back to our client or our CEO to tell them this story, great story, but it's not suitable for the media. This is where our salesman will take it down to the ground to tell our customers. This story is great for our own TikTok channel or our own Instagram, not suitable for the media. And this is where our role is and we have to be brave and bold enough to push back. And I think that's a key role. If we're unable to push back and we just do whatever we're told, then obviously, like what Andrea said, we are not delivering value. So I think that's, that's the key thing that we all of us need to be aware of. Yeah. Fantastic. We're just putting up a poll here for everyone to see. We're asking participants today, have they gained perspective from this masterclass? 81% and counting, it was at 85% uh, just a short while earlier, uh, have said yes, that they have gain from uh, this masterclass. Very quickly, uh, Cam uh, and uh, Vijay, perhaps you could provide uh, your summary as we close today's discussion. Um, because you're older, I'll let you go last, Cam. I'll start with oh, <laughs> That's clearly a compliment. Look at the two Remember of us. Okay. your mom said I'm younger. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, let's, let's be quick about it. So, you know, Andy hit the nail on the head. It's your job to go back as the professional and inside do two things. One, explain to them how it works and that you can't put everything this way as much as you like it. Number two, it's your job also to tell them, hey, this is what people are saying about you, you know. You're not shy, okay? Because that is the key role of the corporate communications person that a lot of people forget about. You are actually the conscience of the company, you know. And you know why I say that? I mean, that sounds funny because you don't own anything else but the brand. You know, the engineering guy, he owns his machines. The sales guy owns the numbers. The product guy owns his product. The comms guy owns Jack. The only thing you own is your brand. Sometimes people ask me, so exactly what do you do? Actually, my, my mother once said, actually, what do you do? Or what is his job? I say, you see that big logo up there? My job is to make sure that it's shining and looking bright all the time. And that's not just about shouting outside. It's internally going back to your company and saying, should you do this? You look at Enron, you look at all the, the FUPAs that happened over the last few years, right? 
it was never the mistake that was the bigger problem, you know. It was the action after the mistake. And that's where corporate communication is very important. And that's where your relationship with the media comes in. Because if you've, if Cam trusts that I will not send him a fuzzy story, then when something goes wrong, he's also likely to reach out to me and say, listen, I heard this, do you have a point of view? So remember that, that the relationship with the media is dependent on two things. You add value to them by being honest. When you're in trouble, they will give you the benefit of the doubt. So bound, boundary spanner, if there's nothing else you take away from today, remember you are the boundary spanner. That's why my pitch to Vijay is, you know, we're not going to talk about cars. We're going to talk about the mobility of solidarity, finally, between Malaysia and China through a car, okay? Ayyoh. But that one is on the Frappuccino. But for Jesse and his session, fine. If Combs and Combs people own the brand or own the brand, then the currency must be credibility. And you cannot have credibility without truth. I mean... How many comms person can really tell me that the final product of their press release contains the first truth that came to their mind? I mean, if you can do that over the Frappuccino, I'll meet you anytime, anywhere, PKP or regardless. I'll get the letter for us to meet. But the point is this, you know, it, it, it really warms my heart when even at the very supposedly elitist call of Davos in January. But the moment we share the stories and what we do from Malaysia, I am a nobody compared to Anderson Cooper. I am a nobody compared to a BBC anchor. But they still had to listen to my points and the points I'm making, even though I'm a nothing brand relatively, because the truth and the credibility stands tall. And in the era where fake news and virality of questionable truths are out there, that is the biggest currency you can have. So I am appealing that I know what you have to do as a communication person, but at the end of the day, if you give a thought to that truth and credibility, I will always be able to walk with you, if not run with you. And I will fight for you to be the next CEO because the era of only the accountants becoming CEOs, especially of JLC, is why comms has suffered because they ask the number of dollars and cents first. How can dollars and cents, especially in the pandemic era, be higher than the lives and the touch points and the feelings of the people who are worried not just for their livelihood, but for their lives and the lives of their families. And with that, I am Fantastic, Kim. Thank you so much for that wonderful summary. Icing on the cake for sure. I'm the thorn among all these roses today. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Andreas Premish. Andy, Vijay, and Kamaro. It's been an, indeed an honor. We're getting so much po positive feedback. If you can look at the chat groups as well, coming from our Q&As and uh, the comments, everyone's leaving. About 266 participants. I just wanted to recap very quickly, coming from Vijay, the CRAP framework, the acronym of CRAP. Um, that is something I think we should all keep in mind, being current, robust, articulate, does it articulate the point and proximity? These are the questions one needs to ask before sending out a particular story. Um, don't make your product or brand the hero of the story. Instead, the consumer should be positioned as the story. Also, Andres, what you said, add value so that your brand, service, or product can stay ahead um, of, uh, especially during these trying times as well. And clients generally being conservative, it is difficult for PR agencies in this time to pacify both sides. Andy, as you pointed out as well, you'll need to find that balance and you will need to decide what can and cannot work. Uh, Asantia will be sending out um, the recording of this particular masterclass as well as highlighting the key sharings and learnings from this. So once again, thank you to all our hundreds of participants and thank you very much to all our panelists. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, this session will be you know, repeat it again and we'll have all of you on board again. So have a great day. Stay home, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.